Welcome to People Love Process. In this movie, we'll create a custom sticker design in Adobe Illustrator. We'll use a variety of methods, including shape building and stroke building, to create a geometric aesthetic that will work well for this project. This is going to be a fun one, so let's get started. It all starts with drawing for me. So on my workstation in my studio, within a hand's reach, I always have a notepad. Now, I don't really sketch in a sketchbook. Um, that kind of hangs me up. I prefer notepads so I can pull it off, put it in a project folder. And if I screw something up and I don't like it, it's not in a sketchbook. So I prefer notepads. So I keep them on hand so when ideas come up, I can capture them really quickly by doing a thumbnail sketch. And I had an idea for a sticker and it involved a skull and I just started drawing uh, these horns on it and I liked the way it looked. And then I wondered, well, maybe I could wrap type around it. And I think that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. I considered putting a third eye, and I kind of abandoned that idea. Then I start starting to think, what what could the type say? What what How could I use that? And then I thought, maybe bad ink. That'd be kind of cool. And then I started working on this, and that one I didn't like at all. Uh, started thinking about COVID because its horns kind of reminded me of those protrusions that are coming out of the COVID particulate of sorts. And I kind of gave up on that one, too. Um, this one, I don't have any idea what I was thinking, bod, that, that's kind of dumb. And then I was working on, uh, some of the type here when I came up with a bad idea, but once again, I didn't like that. And I go, well, what, what should I call it? What, what could this be? And I'm looking at it and I go, well, he kind of looks nefarious. And I go, oh, that's it. I'll, I'll use that word. And then I'm going, well, maybe I should like change it so it sounds like nefarious but it's nefar nefarian i go that, that that's dumb and then i thought nefarious and i had watched a ds9 episode where miles o'brien uh, penetrated some organized gang of a space gang i guess now that i think about it and it had syndicate in their name and i go ooh, that's kind of a cool name nefarious syndicate i'll go with that so that's kind of my thinking behind the sketch once again started in thumbnail and then this design specifically because of the way we can approach building it is going to be symmetric meaning we can only need to build half of it to get the whole piece of artwork so i drew it symmetrically just drew a line down the sheet of paper and just start drawing this. Now, if you're drawing on the iPad, you could actually do the reflection thing if you're using Procreate, for example, and you would see it flesh out on both sides. That's fine. Um, I prefer to draw an analog. Now, whether you're drawing something graphic or something more realistic, reference is always going to kind of inform you. So you can look at a skull, picture of a skull and decide that areas of the skull, like if we look here on the cheekbone, I think in um, anatomy circles, they call that a zygomatic bone, something like that. And, you know, this will inform you on what, what makes a skull look like a skull. Well, it's these curves here that are under the eye. As it indents going into the forehead, there's this little detail here that we'd want to pick up on the teeth, the gap in between, uh, the bottom of the face on the left and right, of course, and everything else. So it doesn't matter if it, if you're doing something graphic like I am, it can still help you figure out how to deduce it down into simple shapes to reflect what you see in the real thing. Uh, that's what style is all about. So uh, this is kind of how I took artistic license and created this sketch. Once I have my sketch here, um, this is where I'm just going to scan it in. I use a flatbed scanner, usually scan it in around 600, 800 PPI, place it on its layer and hit 15%. Now, some people have already asked me, oh, why don't you go into the layers and hit dim? Well, you could do it that way. It's just, I just find this a lot faster and easier to, to just set the opacity because I'm not going to be moving it. So, um, especially with the layer locked. And then on top of it, it just comes down to simple shape building. I drop a few guides since we're doing it symmetrically. I have a guide that's going to guide the central part of our design. And the one on the left is the, the left-hand side of this design we're going to be working on. Let's go ahead and zoom in. 
because I do want to explain one thing, and that is all of these shapes I've created here, um, these two shapes specifically, no Bezier curves, just the pen tool. Pretty easy, not hard to do at all. Uh, these shapes over here are part of the shape tools, the square tool and the elliptical tool. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is this is the style that I'm working in is a style that you'll use rounding quite a bit. And there's two tools I use for rounding. There's the corner widget in Illustrator. And that way that works is you could select any, any shape. Well, you don't have to, oops, you don't have to just select anchors. You could select the whole shape select the corner widget controls and round all the elements if you want or if you use direct select select um, select anchor points and just round those in this case like that well i use it mostly to do scallop shapes like this because it works really well um, you can start off with the square and if you have a long square you could do it that way short square so on and so forth uh, there's a plugin i've used for years uh, called Dynamic uh, Corners that existed six years prior to the plugin until Adobe um, kind of ripped them off and, in my opinion, didn't implement it as well. And what I mean by that is that certain zoom ratios, you'll have a lot of small elements on your artboard and you go to select a, a corner anchor point to move it or adjust it and you'll accidentally trigger the rounding tool because it'll show up because that's how they integrated it. And I find that kind of annoying. Uh, one thing about the, the corner widget tool in Illustrator is it detects what can be rounded on a square, as I just showed you. But if you go up to a circle, it's not going to do anything because their engineer said, well, this is a circle. You don't round a circle. And that's kind of the way they think because they don't really think in a fashion that they you that illustrators and designers build vector art, in my opinion. Nobody on their staff to tell them, yeah, you can think that way, but that didn't stop Astute from doing it. So if we go over to the Dynamic Corners tool for Astute, yes, you can go to any corner like this, and you can see I don't even have to select it. I can just hover over it and just pull it out however I want. If I like that, I can go over here and just click it. So I love that feature. But it's also smart enough to know, yeah, it's a circle, but we could pull that curve out and reverse that curve. Of course, we can always put it back in if we want to, like this as well. And that's why I like it. It's a smart tool. Um, it, it's intelligent in that, in, in that case. Now, if I go ahead and remove these curves I put down here, you can get the same shape. It just starts with two different shapes. If you're using the, the corner widget in Illustrator, you'd start off with the square. If you're using um, uh, the Astute plugin, you probably want to start off with the circle. So it's a little different in that respect. But here's one thing a lot of people don't realize is even though I have certain settings, like if I go to the Pathfinder palette and go to Pathfinder options, I have redundant points turned on. And what this prevents is one is having any anchor point end up on top of another anchor point and become redundant. Um, even though I have that on, it doesn't remove all the redundant points. So as you shape build, you're going to run into this. So the bottom one here we used using the, the corner widget. And so if I select the top one we used with the plug-in, how many anchor points should be in a shape like this? Well, of course, five. But if we go down here, notice this says six. And by the way, this is another plugin I use. And I love the fact that it will give you this information. You can kind of get at that information through the info panel, but I never have it open. So I always use uh, the plugin to see that. So why does it say six? It's because it, ironically, if we go here with the direct select, creates a redundant anchor point at the top when you use the rounding to create a shape like this. So it's sitting on top of one another. Now, here, here's the thing Astute realizes is that when you shape build, you're going to create redundant anchor points. So if I have the shape selected and I go to the Pathfinder, Pathscribe, which is another plugin for Vectorscribe, which is the plugin is called Vectorscribe. It comes with multiple tools 
One of them is Pascribe, one of them is Dynamic uh, Corners, and there's several others in that plugin. But when I go to the Pascribe panel and I have this shape selected that I use the corner widget on, notice this shows up. That's because this is remove redundant point button. It sees that there's six, it only should be five. I can click that and it removes that redundant point without destroying the shape. Uh, you can't do that in Illustrator. So that's why I use plugins. It just gives me the ability to do more things that natively you can't do in Illustrator. So let's get back to building this. And, and even that said, if you don't want to pay for a plugin, that's fine. You, you don't need to. You can use uh, the corner widget. So we can go here. We can use the corner widget to do this, but we wouldn't want it. I, this is one reason I don't like it. It automatically, by default, assumes you want all corners rounded. I never, like, ever want that. So f you have to do one step first. You have to select an anchor. Then you can round it. It's not too bad, but once again... You do that a million times over a couple of years, work on vector art, that adds up. So that's why I prefer uh, uh, dynamic corners because I can go in on any shape like this and just start pulling it out until I get it right about where, I don't know, right about there. It's fine. And I can round it like that. So it just makes the process easier, in my opinion. And... So let's go ahead and turn on another layer here. Oh, you know what? We need to create the, the skull cap. I'm too busy talking about that. So we'll grab the elliptical tool. We're going to hold option down because we're going to do it from the middle out like this. And we'll go and we'll create the skull. And we're going to go ahead and pull these out so they're straight on each side like that. Then this is where a throwaway shape comes in. No other reason than to take the shape we just created and trim it like that. Now we can turn on another layer here and you can see we have part of the jawbone going. And this is where I'll take these two shapes and I'll go ahead and I'm gonna go unite like this to kind of fuse them together and now we're gonna start uh, doing a lot of rounding here. So I'll go ahead and by the way, all the rounding I'm showing you, you can do with the corner widget. It's just gonna take you a little longer uh, because you have to select anchors in order to, before you can round it. So we're gonna go ahead and round here. And I like this because this will stay in place as I round another one. And so I can just drag it down till I hit that same point and now this interior uh, gap in here is going to be consistent. Then I'll switch over to the um, to the corner widget and just round those and round those like that. I'll switch back to my dynamic corners and I'll pull this out, something like that. We'll put a subtle round here just so it doesn't come to a sharp vertice. And we'll put another one in here. We'll get in more about subtle rounding and you'll see why I even do more rounding after I'm done doing this rounding. Um, then down here, we're gonna go ahead and pull this out right about, right about there's fine. I think that looks pretty good. And this is one reason I like it. I like that I can just select it and then apply it to another one. I can go up here and apply it to that. Then I can go ahead around that. We'll put a little round on there. And it just makes the process go a lot faster, a lot easier. Let's look at a few more shapes. We'll do the eyebrow or the brow, I guess. We'll go in here, go like that. And we'll go ahead and pull that up like this. This is where I'll switch back to the corner widget. I'll round that off. Now that I have that, I'll snap. And this is where Smart Guides comes in. I'll make sure I'm right on the center. I'll create this shape for no other reason than to trim the nose because we're going to reflect that ultimately uh, to get what we want. Now, as I build, I try to build things at 90 degrees because it's just easier, but obviously elements in your design at times are going to be at an odd angle. 
And this is where, yes, you can rotate the screen, but once again, uh, that's kind of overkill in my opinion. So I tend to just take a copy of my sketch and I rotate it. That way I can use elliptical shape to build this easier. Based off of that, I can create these shapes. Just select both of them, go ahead and go Unite. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select this anchor point here. And I'm just gonna drag it over right here and I'm gonna to go to Rotate Tool. I'm gonna to select the same anchor point and all I'm gonna do now is just rotate it. And with Smart Guides on, if you wanted to hit, maybe you had done a certain angle previously for um, another part in the design. In this case, I think that looks about right. That's fine. I can go back to my uh, dynamic corners, select this curve, apply it to this one. This one might be a little big. No, that actually looks good. We'll use it. Oh like that, select, ah, select it there, and then apply the same round to there, like that. So that's how I do rounding on basic shapes. Now, ultimately, we're gonna be reflecting these. So I'm gonna turn this on and just show you some of the things I keep in mind when I'm doing this. Um, uh, some elements at this point I, I want to make sure I don't, because I'm not going to leave this line going through the horn up here or here. I want to edit that. But first, we need to reflect the shapes that need to be reflected. So uh, this horn up here, the horn on the side, uh, we're going to do the jawbone, the brow, and the nose. Every, these two shapes are already kind of... Uh, centralize and we don't need to do that with those so we're going to uh, clone this and once again that's an f key for me f3 command c command f uh, watch my keyboard shortcuts if you want to know how to set up your own uh, keyboard shortcuts so i cloned it which just makes a copy i'm going to go over to reflect s select a central anchor point click and don't do that <laughs> just click and then pull down like that and then you can get it to the the opposite side now it's okay if we go ahead and and we can start uniting shapes together now before i do that just just i usually have a layer in my build file that i'm working on and i call it layer x and i store copies of shapes there uh, just because I might want to use them again someday for something else. But I also do a temp layer where I know I'm going to need this shape that we have here at the top of the eye to go in to create these details. So I don't want to fuse these two like this or I lose that. So what I usually do is I select shapes that I think I might use again, such as these shapes here. And I could even do it with the horns if I uh, thought I might use those again, and then I'll clone it, Command C, Command F, or F3 if you have keyboard shortcuts, and then I'll just move it to a temp layer I have turned off, and then if I need it, I can go back to it. So now I can go ahead and select uh, the left, right, top, bottom, and just fuse all of these together to get a perimeter like this, and now's when I would go in and start editing uh, the other details uh, in this skull. And the other details would be, I don't want it to be shaped exactly like this. So I would select both of these shapes. I go to the scissor tool. Once again, the scissor tool kind of got demoted once the shape tool came in, but it's still really good for certain things. And this is how I'd use it. I go in here first and I'd find out how far, cause I don't want this line to go all the way up here until it hits there. So I'll cut it, I don't know, right about there. And then with this and this selected with smart guides turned on, notice I can hover over and it tells me when I'm intersecting a path and then that's where I'll cut it. Then I can get rid of that shape here. This is easy. I can cut it anywhere here and here, select this shape, delete them, select this anchor point, slide it over till it snaps, slide it over till it's, oh, and you see how this isn't up oh, there. It's snap coming back the opposite way. Sometimes Illustrator won't snap like this. 
This is the sn uh, snapping bug in Illustrator. So I usually drag it past, stop, reselect, and then it will snap. It's an intermittent problem. I don't know why they don't fix it. Because, well, I know why they don't fix it. They have nobody on staff who actually builds on a daily basis on the Illustrator team using Illustrator. That's why they don't fix it. They don't see it as a problem. Um, we'll go to shape building. I'll select both, hold option down, hover over this line, just delete it. This is what the shape building tool is ideal for, is for editing, just to get that detail like that. And I would, I'm not going to go ahead and do it again over here, but I just replicate it on the opposite side. We can also take the nose shape down here, minus the guide and unite that together into one cohesive shape. And obviously I'd go in and I'd round, um, I'd be consistently rounding as I went forward. So up here, you know, whether it's taking uh, the rounding on any of these and applying them down here like that, and then maybe the side over here and then applying it like that. So um, I do rounding progressively as I'm going through a project. Now, once I have all the perimeter done, then I you know, work on all the interior lines. And this is where going back to that temp file I saved, I'll grab some of those elements so I can build the areas like this here um, using those shapes to go off of. You don't want to just throw stuff away. So it really helps to do this. So it's at this point I need to determine the thickness of the stroke because we're going to beef it up. So I'm going to turn on this layer We'll go ahead and Command A to select everything, go to Strokes. And right now I was building at 0.75. I usually build around 0 0.75, 0 0.5. Uh, don't focus on color until I get to just fill shapes where I can focus on color. Um, that said, I know a lot of people that don't do that. So it just depends on what your, your preference is. But on a design like this, I'm focusing on shape and form at this point. I don't want to get distracted with, with color. Uh, we're going to hit four on this and look at it. Let's go ahead and zoom in. Okay, there's a few problems, and one of them is notice this line. If I go into outline mode, command Y, you can see it went past it. Sometimes that's okay, but you can see if I expanded this and fused it together, um, that would stick out. So I'm going to select both, go to the shape building tool, hold option down and just delete those. I think I have it on, yep, I have it on this side too, like that. And that way it'll terminate within this shape and it'll work really well. Now, the other problem is when you're working with strokes, you have to pay attention to um, your corners. And so what I tend to do is I always use rounded corners. You can see that over here. But notice on these, the, the terminals are uh, flat caps. And I don't think that looks good. So there's certain shapes I don't need it on. I don't need it on the nose. I don't want it on the eye because we just trim that. So we will deselect those. Um, everything else I think I want it on. So we're going to turn on round cap. And I just think that looks a lot better, these coming to a round like that. Um, actually, on this one, uh, this won't even have an outline at this point. I'll just have a fill on that shape like that. I think I will. But anyway, this is the point I get it to. And now I want to expand the shapes. Uh, but here's another thing. Uh, I think we need to pay attention to. Yes, you'll use round cap, but you could still run into problems. So the easiest way to show this was to set it up by coloring the strokes different colors. So we're just going to jump right into that just so I can explain this better. Let's go ahead and zoom in on the top here. And so you see how I had round caps turned on. Well, the problem with this at times is if I went ahead and expanded this, this could potentially add extra anchor points here or even a redundant anchor point. So what I usually do, I have smart guides turned on. So if you do, I would just select this, direct select it and slide it down its own path just so it's away. So when it's expanded, it'll just fuse together with this shape cleanly and not cause any additional anchor points. So that's what I pay attention to at this stage. Let's go to another area that might look a little confusing. Like here, if 
I select the yellow, you can see it ends here. So this is still, I think, going to work okay there. And if we go down to these, those are pretty simple. And I think everything else, oh, maybe the middle of the eye here. So these, once again, and we'll expand it. So that's all I'm going to do now. Now, the shape of the eye itself, this wasn't a closed shape, but you can do a fill on a non-closed path. So this has the outline and the fill applied to it. And we even, I even went back in on the nose and I put a small outline just because um, I just thought it looked a little better than being as thin as it was. So um, all we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to go ahead and select all these shapes. And we're going to go up to path, outline stroke. It's going to turn all of these into actual uh, fill shapes. And now we can go unite. And it's going to default to whatever the topmost object is. So let's go ahead and change it to black like this. And that's looking good. But the black we actually don't need. The black is what we need to get rid of. So we'll go to object, compound, and release. And you might need to ungroup it a few times. Yeah, you can see there's an ungroup. And as soon as that's grayed out, means you've ungrouped everything. So I'm going to go ahead and select the outermost shape here and just delete it. Select everything here, actually just the background on the top and bottom of the skull. We'll go ahead and color this just uh, magenta for the time being. I'm going to select all the interior shapes here like this. And we'll unite those like that. And when I say unite, it's just going to group them. So you'll want to turn that into a compound. I have F7 set up to do that so I can select this shape and I can go minus front to punch through it, select this shape. We'll unite it. It'll go back to group again. That's why I have my keyboard shortcut of F7 turned on. We'll go ahead and color this white and you see nothing. That's because ultimately, let's go ahead and grab this and go to a line. We're going to have a background on this that looks like that. So it's just a one color design for the most part. But we want to add rounds. And this is where I go back to the rounding tool because you can see these are dagger sharp now. All the other ones are fine, but I go back in and I go ahead and round these out to a certain degree, whatever I thought looks well. And so what, what I want to do now is I want to add other rounding detail to this. So let's go ahead and do that. And I want to zoom in on this area of the mouth and the jawbone. And you can see all the rounds we originally did look fine. Um, but when it gets to the teeth, you know, these are a little too perfect, a little too sharp. And I think uh, just using the rounding tool, um, and once again, you can do all this with the corner widget. I just prefer uh, doing it with uh, the plugin dynamic corners because I can figure out what diameter looks good. And then I can go into each of these and just round them however, uh, and just apply it to the other corners like that. So it, it works it works really nice. Um, I, I've used this for so many years. I'll go into areas like this and add little rounds like that. Even on this, I just don't want anything to really come to a point in this design uh, because then it looks computer driven. And I just find the aesthetic looks so much nicer when you do this. Now let's go up here and focus on this area because you, you can see we have all these rounds and just see what it looks like between non-rounded and now I'm going to turn on the round. Look at how much better, whether it's the interior of the eye here or up here where it comes to a point in these areas, it just looks really, really nice when you take the time to add these kind of subtle rounds in your design. It makes it look more custom. Now it's at this point in the creative process where I'll physically print out uh, this drawing because I want to draw on top of it to figure out my shading. Now, if it was my daughter, um, she would probably do her drawing on her iPad, just make an image screen capture, bring it on her iPad and do it there. Whichever you prefer is fine. The point is I, f I 
I think it goes faster by drawing out how I'm going to handle the shading rather than just monkeying around in Illustrator to kind of just wing it on the fly. Um, it's more strategic that way. So this is where I printed it out. And actually, I had to jump on another project. So I set it aside, came back to it the next morning. I was looking at it. And I go, you know what? If we go back to my original thumbnail, I had these side horns, but along the way, decided not to add them. And now I'm second guessing that. And so if we look to where I'm at now, this is where I decided, well, you know, I saved those elements in the template with the horns. So I went back and took these, flipped them, brought them down, and I worked out these horns. And then I'm sitting here looking at it and I'm going, I'm not sure I like that. And then it hit me why I don't like it. And that's usually for me, that's how art directing myself goes. I might not know immediately why I don't like something, so I set it aside, come back to it later, and I can almost always figure it out. And this is where you want to trust somebody who you can run stuff by and say, hey, what doesn't look right here? Now, I would encourage you to make sure you like their design on a regular basis. Otherwise, I wouldn't want their feedback on that. That's important in my opinion. And when I looked at it again, I realized I know why I don't like it. You're missing that nice curve on that, uh, what's it called, a zygomatic bone under the eye here. And so I went back, edited this further, and I like this a lot more. I think this is it. This nailed it for me. And I think that kind of self art direction is important. Now, when I said I printed out and drew on it, this was the exact drawing that I drew on. Now notice um, I had taped this piece on because I printed it out before I had the horns figured out or added back into the artwork. And so I had to uh, basically cut this, print out a second thing and uh, cut it out, paste it, and then match my drawing uh, with my artwork to give me a guide. Now, whether you actually place this back in the Illustrator or not to build from is up to you. Uh, for me, sometimes I do it. Sometimes I just reference my drawing sitting on my desktop as I build because it's so simple. This was a little more complex. So I did uh, scan it back in and we're going to go ahead and adjust the transparency. Just like my base art, I'm going to build it using the same methodology of creating the shapes on top based off of the underlying drawing I kind of figured out in a drawn form. Uh, so this is where the coloring comes in. Simple color palette for this design. We're just going to select these shading shapes. These are all going to be uh, colored gray. And I think this highlighting really came out nice. Now, this design is going to be, uh, we're going to utilize this orange, I was thinking at this point. So we're going to work out the typography. And I have a elliptical shape here that I already kind of cut in half with the, the scissor tool. And we're going to wrap type on the top and the one on the bottom here. So the first thing we're going to do is pick out a, a font style we want. And we're going to go up here to font, go down. And the one we're looking for is this one called Itelka Text Bold. So I'm going to select that. We're going to go to the Type on Path tool. I like pulling these out so they're always there. I don't have to dive into here to find them. They're just easy, accessible. And then we're going to just hover over the path we want to apply the type to and just click it. It's going to default to flush right. So I always go center. And in this case, I go center. It's going to default to black. Let's turn that to white. You can see the lorem ipsum type. Now, these controls that there's one on the left, one on the right down here, and one in the center. These are what controls how it aligns on the path. So I'm going to pull this until it snaps to the far left. And you have to watch this because this will move at times and make sure it's all the way down. That way, it's perfectly centered. And now this is the part for years, I didn't even know this existed until uh, about three years ago, was object 
and you'd have to go down, oh, I'm sorry, type, and you'd go down to type on path, then you'd have to go over, then you'd have to go down. I really wish it wasn't hidden like this. I wish it was on a forward-facing uh, panel and click on type on path, then you have to click under uh, the align to path, then you have to click on center. It's just really hidden. Uh, why this was so hidden, but this will center the type on the path instead of using the path as a baseline like that. And that's what we want. Obviously, we don't want it to uh, be lorem ipsum. We want it to be uh, the type we want. So we're going to go ahead and click into there. Oops. And I should admit, type on a path is kind of wonky. Let's go ahead and bump this up. We'll bump it up 25 like that and then we'll be able to select it and then we can type in all uppercase the nefarious syndicate like that i don't think that's big enough let's go ahead and go to 40 see what that looks like that might be good and now comes uh doing the adjustments and the adjustments meaning we want to go to the type controls. So I'm going to move this up because I have it down here at the bottom of my screen. And this tells you what the size is, what the, um, in this case is the kerning. Um, I, I'm sorry, the leading. The leading doesn't so much matter for this, so we can kind of ignore this. Uh, but we're just going to adjust this. And the type's a little big. Let's let's knock down the size. So I'm going to knock it down to like 35. Oh, I like that better. And we're going to adjust the the tracking. And this will put. And I know there's some type purists out there. No, don't track. Uh, I track all the time. I don't know what the big deal is. I think it looks good. And we'll type in this. I think that'll wrap it most of the way like that. Now, the one thing you have to pay attention to when you're working with type on a path like this, at times, this will like happen. And if you're not paying attention, technically, um, it means this isn't ending where it should be uh, perfectly positioned. So you'll have to pull that down. So watch that because it does move at times as you're, you're messing around with stuff. So that's that one. We're going to do another one here. And this one, we'll go back to the type. Let's go ahead and select type, go to font. And we're going to use Corolev. Uh, uh, Kuro Kuro um, it's a device font. A uh, fabulous designer in the UK did this font. And we're going to go to the bold. So Corolev condensed bold. And we'll go to type on path. And the one down below, this is where uh, the type on path functionality in Illustrator really doesn't shine because um, it, it kind of it assumes too much. Oh. There we go. Once again, you have to adjust it. Um, you would think after I did the central, it'd be smart enough to know, well, we'll default to central on this since it's the last setting you use. It does that for other tools, but not the type tool. So once again, we're going to have to go to type. We're going to have to go to type on path. We're going to have to go to type on path options. And we're going to have to click on that. Then we're going to have to go to baseline. Then we're going to have to center. And then you can preview it if you want and then click OK. So kind of a, a long rigmarole just to, to get to it. Now we'll type in, uh, once again, we're going to do all uppercase, international consortium. I can tell this is going to be way too big. So let's go ahead and adjust this. We'll go down, I don't know, 18 points maybe. Oh, that's probably too little. Let's try 20. Okay, we'll just continue where we left off. So, Consortium of Evil Overlords. Now, if you think of the Avengers, you know, they're all the superheroes. And this is kind of the branding for a, a consortium of uh, super villains, I guess. It's kind of what I had in mind. Uh, we're going to bump this up. 25 and 
defaulted. See, the, the, it's defaulting to what I used for the last one. Why can't it do it for the, the centering? Um, let's try this a little more, maybe even more than that. I want to leave space because I'm planning on putting type here, but I don't want to get it. I don't want to pinch it like that. So once I get this, I'll select these two. And this is where I'll go to type and I'll go to create outlines like that. And I'll outline it. By the way, I have a keyboard shortcut for that, but I wanted to show you in the menu. And now I'll go to Pathfinder. I'll go ahead and unite that. Just remember when you do that, it's actually a group. So I turn it to a compound. We're gonna leave that type white uh, because I want it white. But on the secondary type and the affinity element on top, I'm gonna select this and I'm gonna color this that nice orange. And it was at this point that I go, guy, I like the orange. He needs orange eyes. And once I added this, I'm going, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Now, what can you do with a design like this? Well, this is gonna be stickers, of course, but you know, I also have it on Cotton Bureau, so you could get it on a hoodie or a t-shirt if you want. And if you're not familiar with cottonbureau.com, check it out. It's a great way to do uh, custom shirts and offer them, and they do all the delivery and you make royalties off of the sales, so pretty cool. Um, I did do stickers for this one, and this is how the stickers came out. So it did actually become a sticker project. Now, not everything created in vector format requires extensive pen tool methods. If you think in shapes, you can create a lot of things without having to adjust any Bezier curves as you saw in this movie. So remember, access to the exercise files or of any of the people love movies for that matter on my channel can be found in the description text below each movie. Uh, for the first 10 people that get the exercise files for this movie, I'll mail you a Nefarious Syndicate sticker as my way of saying thanks. So if you like this movie, please consider sharing a link to my YouTube channel on your social media account. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe as well. Thank you for watching People of Process. I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.